through the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, youth, you are dismissed. We're in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 14. We're only going to cover half the chapter this morning. So let's read it, and then we will look at it in detail. (coughs) Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called the little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. If your right hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet and to be cast into everlasting fire. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, as you can see, the the message this morning is entitled, Vision plus Commitment equals Greatness. Vision plus Commitment equals Greatness. out of curiosity, has anybody other than me and my family watched any of the Olympics? Yeah, pretty much all of us have maybe seen one or two events. Now, of all the great athletes that have achieved success, and there have been many, Usain Bolt, man, the fastest man on the planet. Uh, Michael Phelps, I think he is genetically engineered to be part fish, uh, certainly out swimming everybody. But there's one athlete who's really stood out to me, And that's the ladies' gymnast, Gabby Douglas. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Thank you for that. No, actually, I take no credit. But uh, Gabby Douglas, now she's only 16 years old, only 16, and yet she has sacrificed more and has worked harder than most of us, myself included. For the last 10 years, 10 years she's been in training, spending countless hours sweating, pain, pushing herself every day for the last 10 years in and even out of the gym training. Now, two years ago, she moved from her mother and her home in Virginia Beach, and that's there in Virginia, in order to live with a host family near her coach's gym in West Des Moines, Iowa. Moved from family and friends, everything familiar, two years ago at the age of 14 in order to live with some strange family in a strange place, In Iowa, in her words, and I quote, a gold medal costs a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And it also costs a lot of money, lots and lots of money. In fact, so much so that Gabby's mother this year has had to file for bankruptcy due to all the costs incurred, all the money she spent in order that her daughter might receive that training. Well, Don't lose sleep over their situation because Gabby's gold medal has, already has, and will continue to turn into golden endorsements. They're going to be just fine. 
Now, Gabby admitted that there were many times that she wanted to quit. When she was away from family in those few hours of downtime, she was very sad, missed her mama and her brothers and sisters. She wanted to quit. The intense training pushed her to the brink, but she kept her eyes on the prize. She pushed through her motions. She refused to take the easy road out, and she stuck to it. The results? She won the all-around gold medal in the women's all-around gymnastics. In other words, she is currently the world's greatest female gymnast. And seeing what the guys did, she's better than them too. (laughs) Now, there are many people who want to be great in something. Maybe sports, maybe business, or some other field. But... There are many people who never achieve success. They never achieve greatness. Why? Well, aside from the genetic issue, I mean, you know, I wanted to be a... a, a, Years ago, I wanted to be an Olympic basketball player. But you cannot teach somebody height. You cannot learn height. So that was out for me. Uh, There are people that want to achieve greatness, and aside from the genetic component, there are two things that we need in order to achieve greatness. Number one, vision. Number two, commitment. There are some who never achieve greatness because they lack either one or both. Some don't have vision. They want to be great, but they really don't know what greatness means. They don't have clearly defined goals. Their vision isn't sharp. Maybe their eyesight is blurred by other things. And then there are others who don't see, uh, don't achieve greatness. They see what success is. They have a sharp vision, but yet they lack the will and the determination to simply get her done. But for those who do have clear vision and those who are fully committed, all in, are those who will achieve greatness. And this principle of vision and commitment also applies to greatness in the kingdom of heaven, not just in the world, in sports or business or what have you, but having vision with commitment will translate itself into spiritual greatness. Now, unlike athletes... A vision of greatness is not something we choose for ourselves. For Gabby, it's a gold medal. For LeBron James, it was finally winning one championship. And for other athletes, it could be, you know, a number of home runs per year. In baseball, of course. (laughs) But unlike athletes who get to choose what greatness means for them, we as Christians have already been given by God a vision for what true heavenly greatness Greatness is. God has already given that to us in His Word. So the vision comes from God, but you know what? The determination does come from us. The will to want to achieve God's vision of spiritual greatness, that definitely comes from us within. And when we align our will with the will and the power of the Holy Spirit, we then will achieve. Spiritual greatness. Well, question. What does spiritual greatness look like? What is God's vision of spiritual greatness for you and me? Well, here in chapter 18, Jesus clearly defines what God's vision for greatness for you and me is. And again, if we align our will with His and we commit ourselves to doing what God has told us to do, you and I, we will achieve spiritual greatness. In verses 1 through 5, we're told, convert and become, or you won't get in. Convert and become, or you won't even get in. Verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, this wasn't the first time, and it wouldn't be the last time, that these guys would jockey for position. As I mentioned last week, even uh, the mother of James and John came to Jesus and she, being a good mama, wanting the best for her boys, said, I want you, Jesus, to do for me whatever I ask. 
It would be like somebody coming up to you and saying, I want you to do whatever I ask. And, of course, you would then say, well, what are you asking? We'd be a fool to say, okay, sure. Now, what is it you want? And so Jesus, being no fool, said, well, what is it that you request? And she said, oh, well, when you come into your kingdom, grant that my sons may sit one on your right hand and one on your left. All I'm asking is for the most prominent positions in the kingdom of heaven, just shy of your position. Of all the people that ever lived, Moses, Elijah, David, Daniel, all of them, I want my sons, John and James, to be more prominent than them. (laughs) Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking. Can they drink the cup that I am about to drink? Can they be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? He, Jesus, was referring to his death and suffering. The disciples, however, they, they're clueless to that. And so even they at that point, they're with their mama, said, Oh, yeah, sure we can. And Jesus said, Oh, you will. You then will drink from the cup. You will then be baptized with my baptism. But to give those positions of authority, that's not for me. That's in the Father's keeping. And so in that story and in many other places, we see the disciples were always wanting to jockey for position, wanting to be the greatest, in their minds, having authority over others. Because isn't that what greatness in the world means? Having authority, being number one, coming out on top. That's what greatness in this world means, and that's what the disciples were thinking. But Jesus radically Revealed to them that his kingdom is upside down from the world. Actually, the world's upside down. Jesus' kingdom is right side up. They were thinking of fame and fortune. But Jesus revealed that heavenly greatness is just the opposite. To illustrate this point, Jesus used a little child. Look look at verse 2. Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them. So they said, what's greatness? And Jesus said to this little kid, hey, come here, please, would you? And he props him up, has everybody looking at him. And he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So not only won't you be great, you won't even get in. No entrance into heaven without converting and becoming. Now, first converting. We are converted, transformed, changed, translated from children of the devil. And we're all born children of the devil. Ask any parent of any two-year-old, they will tell you, we're all born children of the devil. (laughs) We are transformed. We are converted from children of the devil into children of God, adopted into his family when we are born again. A religious ruler came to Jesus by night. His name, Nicodemus. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, except a man be born again, he won't even see the kingdom of heaven. Now, he went on to reveal that we must be born again of the Spirit of God. It's a spiritual rebirth. We've all had a physical birth. We must, if we want to get into heaven, have a spiritual rebirth which occurs when we trust in Jesus as our personal Savior and Lord. He said in that same uh, discourse with Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him, you're basically saying, you know what, I'm I'm now going to believe in Jesus. He's my Savior. He's the only way of salvation. Now I'm asking him, I'm inviting him to be my Savior and my Lord. Whoever believes in him should not perish but has everlasting life. So by faith in Jesus Christ, we are converted from children of Satan and we become children of God. And as children of God, once we've been converted, we must then evidence that by becoming, becoming like little children. Notice verse 4. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, little children, there is a humility about them. I know they know the word mine, me first, and all that. 
But yet there is a humility. Do you ever notice how you can have two little kids that fight like cats and dogs on the playground one moment, and then a few minutes later they're the best of friends? Now, if you have an argument with an adult, they're your enemy for life. You never want to see them. Because we lack the humility to forgive and forget. Little children, in their way, can forgive and they can forget. Little children are humble in that they are not consumed with expressions of earthly greatness like fame and fortune. Kids, little kids, are not about the bling. They're not about the cash. They're not about the cars. They're not about the clothes. In fact, little children, all they want to do is have fun with their friends. Little kids, they just want to play. They just want to have fun with their friends. And, you know, little kids would remain more like it if it weren't for their psycho sports parents or those crazy moms of toddlers and tiaras. Man, that's, that's one of the most disturbing shows on TV, the toddlers. Now, if you have your little toddler in one of those pageants, um, I hope I haven't offended you, but come on, you know? And if it weren't for parents driving their kids to fame and fortune, maybe kids would remain a little more childlike a little longer. Even so for us. Becoming like little children, among other things, means that instead of trying to one-up one another, trying to beat one another, we instead, we just just love one another. We're humble enough to forgive and forget and move on. And to just love one another. So that's one aspect of being humble like a, a little child. Another aspect that shows that we have this mindset as we are adults here is this. How we treat little children indicates whether or not we have a childlike, humble attitude, whether we have become like children. How we treat them reveals whether or not we become like them. Notice in verse 5, whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Whoever receives a little child in my name, you know, some adults, kids are a bother to them. Kids are a burden to them. But you know, apparently, according to Jesus, those same adults are being bothered and burdened by Jesus himself. Because if we receive them, Jesus says, you're receiving me. This is one reason why I am fully committed to seeing our children's ministry here grow and thrive at Calvary Chapel Bartlett. Why we put so much time and effort and money into the children's ministry here at Calvary Chapel Bartlett. Because Jesus said when we receive them, we are receiving him. If you want to see Jesus, maybe you ought to pray about getting more involved in children's ministry. Now right now, we'll be happy to put you on a waiting list. Because right now, all the slots are filled. (gasps) Miracle has taken place. The slots... The monthly rotations have been filled. Now, some of you that are thinking about quitting the children's ministry, no, you're not allowed to. Right now it's filled. Let's keep this going for a while. But if you'd like to get on the waiting list, we would love to put you on it. But if you want to see Jesus, consider getting involved in children's ministry. So, he says, if you are converted and become, then you enter into the kingdom of heaven. But without converting and becoming... Won't even get in. Number two, in verses six through nine, we're told to cut off offenses. We want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Begins with converting and becoming. Second step is cut off offenses. Cut off offenses. Verse six. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him If a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. In other words, a person would be better off committing suicide by drowning himself with one of these millstones. There's the upper one and the lower one. (laughs) Either weighs several hundred pounds. Either would do the job nicely. So if a person, a person would be better off committing suicide by tying his neck 
uh, up with one of these and then casting himself into the sea, then causing a believer to sin. Look at verse 7. Woe to the world because of offenses. There are a lot of things in our society that offend the Holy Spirit of God. That offend our born-again, redeemed, resurrected spirits within us. There are many things in this world that the world gladly embraces that are completely offensive to God. Woe to the world because of offenses. Judgment is coming to the world because of these offenses. Now, offenses must come. That's just a sad thing. We're in this world. We're stuck here. We're supposed to be witnessing and sharing the gospel. Yes, we're in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. They do what they do because they are sinners, but we are to do what God wants us to do because we are saints. And so we're here, we're stuck. Offenses must come. That's just the way it is. Until Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom, there will be many offenses in this world. But he says, Woe to that man by whom the offenses come. Woe to the pornographers. Woe to the drug traffickers. Woe to the sex slave people who kidnap girls and boys and traffic them around the world. Woe to presidents and senators and congress members who side with abortionists and homosexuals and others who engage in what the Bible calls sin. Through the legalization of offenses, of things that offend our righteous God, there are many young, weak believers who, because it's legal, have gone ahead to flirt with those things and have even fallen into those things. And there are some believers who are in bondage to those things and they don't know how they can get free. Yes, we as believers are responsible for our own actions. We have nobody to blame but ourselves. But woe to those who promote and who provide for sin. For those offenses. It would be better if they would commit suicide than for them to continue to promote immorality in this world. And I would also say woe to pastors who teach false doctrine. Who are more about building up church numbers than about building up believers. Who are more about messages of health, wealth, and prosperity, that which tickles the ears, that which feeds the flesh, but that which is offensive to God. You see, when a pastor gets up and says, you know, you can have the best now. And you can have whatever you want now, and all you need to do is believe hard enough and pray long enough and and just command God to give you what... You can have whatever you want. You know what they're doing? They are... Causing the body of Christ to sin through covetousness. Desiring things. Strongly desiring worldly possessions. Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness. For your life does not consist. Your life is not about the things that you possess. How sad it is that people are valued by the junk they have in their garage. By the stuff they have ferreted away in their attic by the numbers in their bank accounts, by the clothes they wear. It's a sad day that we live in. People are valued by that. And sadly, there are pastors and preachers who are teaching and preaching that you can have whatever you want. But what they're doing is promoting the sin of covetousness. Folks, we live in a sin-sick, death-cursed, corrupt world. And now, because Jesus' return is imminent, any day now, it's high time God's people take matters into their own hands, even if it means cutting those hands off. Notice the next verse in verse 8. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, 
Cut it off and cast it from you. For it is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. In other words, it's better to sacrifice and suffer loss on this side of eternity than to remain whole and enter into hell on the other side. So the Lord is telling us to start doing some radical things. Does he mean literally cut your hand off? No, because if you did, you'd have one more hand to to sin with. Does he mean literally cut your foot off? No, because you'd have uh, another foot. And if you cut both both off, you'd probably learn how to walk on your knees. Taking you to the sinful place again. He's not talking necessarily about maiming our physical bodies. But he certainly is telling us to be much more aggressive at eliminating the opportunities for sin than currently we already are. To be more aggressive about getting sin out. Notice in verse 9, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. So if where you go and what you do And what you see causes you to sin. Jesus says, cut it off or else. For some, it's a computer that needs to be cut off. needs to be put away. Or at the very least, brought out into the living room, into the dining room where the rest of the family is. For some, it's it's the TV that needs to go. Because you're being drawn to those channels that you know are, are just stirring the lust of the flesh. For some, it might even be their career, their job. I don't know how I'm going to make it if I don't keep this job of working as a waitress at a topless bar downtown. There's some people who have that that misconception. i got to have, that's the job that God provided. No, it's not. Some need to cut off their career. Now, I, I do want to stress that cutting off sinful habits, cutting off those opportunities is not necessarily going to make somebody great in the kingdom of heaven. But as Jesus warned, if you don't cut it off, you're going to wind up in hell. And those are his words here. It is better to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. I think what the Lord would say to us is take radical steps to rid yourself, to rid ourselves, myself included, Take radical steps to rid ourselves from anything that tempts us to sin. Anything or even anyone. It might be a friend that needs to be cut off. You know, that party person that always trying to get you to do stuff you know you're not supposed to do. You know, there's, I, I've noticed that uh, in the past there was, uh, you know, a few teenage girls and they were together and they're always talking about boys. Boys, boys, boys. I was talking about boys, and this boy, he's so cute, he's so hot, he's so this. Oh, that guy, he's a jerk, he's this. And I'm thinking, first of all, it's gossip. Secondly, what? You know, why go there? Why go there? Those boys you're interested in, now you're not going to marry them. If you're 15, 16 years old or whatever your age is, do you think, honestly, that guy you're drawn to, or if you're a guy, that girl you're drawn to, that's the one you're going to marry? And just show hands of, of we adults. How many of you... Married the person that you were really in like with when you were 14 years of age. One. One out of all of us. You, you, you guys? No, I didn't think so. Yeah, you liar. So, yeah. I met Amanda when, when I was 20. Before that, I wasn't ready to be married. And it was foolish of me at that point to give my heart out to anybody because I wasn't prepared. You know, start dating at, at a young age. I always think, how, how sad. You know, you, you, you give your heart out at that point and you're not supposed to do anything with giving your heart out. You've got all these emotions and you're not supposed to engage in them and you have no job, you have no place to live. And so what business do you have in giving your heart out like that? That's just silly. Eh, people do it all the time. I don't know. I did it. It was silly. It was wrong for me. But anyway, it could be somebody who's stirring that lust of the flesh, trying to to get you to talk about stuff that just doesn't matter. And maybe a friend needs to be cut off. Don't need to hang out with them anymore. 
Verses 10 through 14. Care enough to share. Care enough to share. Verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. Again, these kids. Jesus said, you minister to them, you minister to me. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. This is a scripture whereby some believe in guardian angels. That we have an angel representing us in heaven. If I have a guardian angel, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a few words with him. There's some times in my life I think he, he dropped the ball. So we're going to have words when I get to heaven. But one thing is, is sure, little ones, according to Jesus, do indeed have an angel in heaven or angels in heaven who behold the Father's face. They're before the presence of God. Now, this is adding to the importance of loving and caring for little children, of ministering to them. Because you know what? They have heavenly representatives. And that's important. They are important so much so they have, God has established representatives for them in heaven. They are before the throne of God, seeing his face. So Jesus' point is, it's not good to despise one who is so near and dear to the Father's heart. And woe unto those who abuse children. Woe unto those who beat their kids. Now, it's one thing to spank and to punish in correction, but it's another thing to beat and abuse. And especially woe unto those who rob the innocents of little children through their own perversions. Woe unto those men and even some women who have done that. For the Son of Man... Verse 11 has come to save that which was lost. I I notice here, and, and I hope we all notice, caring for little ones, Jesus ties with coming to save. Caring for the little ones, having concern, compassion, he ties that with, for the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Jesus cares so much about little ones and even us not so little ones that he came to the earth paid for all of our sins in full on the cross three days later rose from the dead and that's how much he cares how much does Jesus love us he says I love you this much and in this position he allowed the creation to nail him the creator to the cross that's how much he cares Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, if Jesus cares that much for you and for me, shouldn't we also care about reaching the lost? And if Jesus went to desperate measures, ultimate sacrifice to prove his love to save us, should we not also do all that we can to reach out to the lost? Verse 12, Jesus gives us, the right attitude, the right heart toward the lost. What do you think, he says? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? Now that man, he's not a bad shepherd. He's a good shepherd. He doesn't have an attitude of, oh, well, ninety-nine out of a hundred, that ain't bad. This will be fine. No. No. His attitude is rather, hey, one that is lost is one too many. I'm not going to put up with even one being lost. So, question for us all. Who do we know that's lost? Who do we know that's not part of his family, not part of his flock, not a sheep within his fold? You know, Jesus would tell us, go out and find them. He would tell us, now go out and... And find them, not right now, but after Bible study, his call to us is if we know somebody's lost, go out and find them. And if he should find it, the good shepherd, verse 13, 
he finds the one lost sheep. If he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go to stray. You know, I, I notice here that when he finds the lost sheep, he doesn't scold the lost sheep. No, instead, he simply rescues that lost sheep. And then he doesn't scold it, but he rejoices over it with his friends. He carries that sheep home. And, and even look how happy the little sheep is to be rescued. You know. He rescues it and then rejoices over it. He doesn't scold. Hey, maybe you've been wandering. Maybe you've been like a wandering sheep. You haven't been close. You've been out of the pen, so to speak. Wandering in the wilderness and got yourself in trouble. And you're in trouble. You know, the Lord is not here to scold you. He's here to rescue and to restore and to rejoice. God loves you. And, you know, the, the wonderful thing about God's love is he's omniscient. He knows all things. From the beginning to the end, he has known all things. He even knew when you'd wander away. He knew what you would do when you wandered away. He still loves you. Your sin, your rebellion has not come as a shock to him. He's not in heaven going, oh, I can't believe you did that. After all I've done for you, why did you do that? You know? No, he's not doing that. He knew. May we know how much he loves us and how much he wants us back. And may we just come to him. Maybe today, after the closing song, you might want to come forward. There will be people here that would love to pray with you. That God might rescue you, restore you, and rejoice over you. Even so... It is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And we talked earlier about greatness, having vision and commitment. Then we achieve spiritual greatness. Well, the vision is, of course, humbling ourselves as little children, converting and becoming. And then here's something else he, he tells us to do. Have a burden for reaching the lost. Have a burden for the lost. This is part of the package of being great in God's kingdom. Care enough to share. The attitude of somebody who's great in the kingdom of heaven is one who says, I will not rest until all that I know have heard the gospel. Until everybody I know has heard from me, somehow, some way, has heard the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he loves them, he died on the cross, and rose from the dead to save them from their sins. And if they would only believe in him, they too would receive everlasting life. Somebody great in the kingdom of heaven has a burden for the lost. Now, maybe you don't feel very comfortable, very confident about sharing the gospel with somebody. Some of you, it would scare you to death to knock on your neighbor's door and say, hey, I, I want to tell you about how much Jesus loves you. Well, good news for those who are timid, those who are shy. We have placed before us, by God, this wonderful opportunity for the gospel to clearly and powerfully be preached. Harvest America on August 26th, 6 p.m., Sunday evening, here at the church, at Calvary Chapel Bartlett, the gospel will be preached by Pastor Greg Laurie, who the Lord has used mightily to preach the gospel and see thousands upon thousands of people come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the good shepherd searches the highways and byways. He goes up into the mountains looking for the lost sheep and then he brings the lost sheep back to the fold. May we be like that good shepherd with this golden opportunity before us, this Harvest America. Let's be like the good shepherd. Let's go out in the highways and hedges, find them, invite them, and bring them here to hear the gospel so that we could see the Lord save them so that we might rejoice over them that they are now headed for heaven. Let's care enough 
about those that God cares desperately for and go out and compel them to come in. So in this passage, we have been given God's vision of what spiritual greatness is. Number one, converting from a sinner into a saint, which is through faith in Jesus Christ. Number two, becoming humble as little children. Number three, cutting off all things that offend. And number four, caring enough to share the gospel with the lost. You want to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Here you go. You may want to write this down. You may want to pray over it. You might want to ask God to clarify even further the vision that God has for you and for me, that which pertains to spiritual greatness. Don't you want to hear Jesus say on that day, well done, good and faithful servant? Don't you want to hear his, attaboy, girl, good job, good job? I do. And I know all of God's people do. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for laying it out before us. We thank you, Lord, for revealing to us what your plan for our life is. We thank you, Lord, for revealing what true spiritual greatness is. It has nothing to do with money or possessions. It has everything to do with commitment to you and humility and love and compassion and concern. And Lord, going forth and fulfilling the great commission, which is making disciples of all nations. Lord, right now we want to pray for our fellowship here. And we ask, God, that you would burden burden us who are already saved to go out and reach the lost. Lord, it's no accident, no coincidence that we're in this passage with Harvest America just a couple of weeks away. And so, Lord, we pray for that event specifically. And we ask that we, God's people, would be busy about your work bringing them in. Lord, help us to be diligent, to be found faithful. Lord, help us to do, lead us, Lord, to those places, those people that would receive an invitation. Lord, we pray this place would be jam-packed with people who need to hear the gospel. And so, Lord, take care of all the technicalities, all the details. Your will be done. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's kids said... Amen.